Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. HDIX serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the Homeland Defense and Security Community. As such, our organization supports those working in the Homeland Defense and Security domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Homeland Defense and Security DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD Homeland Defense and Security Research. Right, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is John Clements. I am the technical lead for the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC. And uh, we are pleased to bring these, this webinar presentation to you, which is really a an kind of after action review, so to speak, of a tabletop exercise that HDIAC hosted back in June down in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, so we kind of tabletopped a mixed hazardous waste scenario, which uh, the presenter, Joel Hewitt, will go into in detail, so I don't want to spoil too much of it here. But with before we start, I did want to mention, um, you know, everybody is muted. Um, so there's a Q&A section. Uh, there's a three-dot menu bar selection thing down on the bottom right of your screen. You can click on that, click on Q&A, and you can submit a question. And at the end of the webinar, I will go ahead and ask Joel those questions out loud for anybody that might be dialed in, uh, and he'll go ahead and answer them. Uh, there is also a chat function. Feel free to post anything in the chat you want to share uh, with us, and I'll, I'll you know, monitor the chat. So if a question goes in there, I'll make sure it gets to Joel the best I can. But the best way to do it is get it in the Q&A. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, so if you suffer some sort of technical difficulty or you have a colleague that couldn't make it and you were hoping uh, they would be there, uh, we will get it up on YouTube within the next few business days. So it will be there for review after the fact. Um, but with that, uh, I think that's all the administrative things I want to go over. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our webinar presenter. Mr. Joel Hewitt, uh, he's a subject matter expert for the Homeland Defense Security Information Analysis Center, uh, employed by Keylogic Associates. Um, and he, he first joined HDI in 2017, where he applies a decade of experience in energy technology issues as a subject matter expert. He holds an MS from Georgia Institute of Technology in the history and sociology of technology and science, where he was the inaugural Melvin Kranzberg Fellow. He also holds an AB in literature from Davidson College, where he was a John Montgomery Belk Scholar. His book-length study of the offshore oil and gas program in the U.S., The Secret of the Sea, um, was published back uh, by the Interior Department in 2017. So um, he also has authored a state-of-the-art report previously for HDIAC, which you can find on our website on, um, on um, microgrids and their impact on the DOD. Uh, so I encourage you all, he's a phenomenal writer, so I encourage everybody to go ahead and check that out. Um, with that, Joel, I'm working on bringing up the slides as we speak, but uh, you can go ahead and get started while I get that going. All righty. John, thank you for the kind welcome and, and for the plug for the uh, installation microgrids report. Uh, it's really good to be back before the HDI community today. Uh, from my experience, it's an incredibly active and engaged community. Uh, so we're really glad that you were here. 
Uh, as John said, the impetus behind this webinar is to discuss and recap a little bit an event that we hosted in June of this year, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. A tabletop exercise, or TTX, that posited an event of considerable concern, um, both in the Homeland Defense, military, and the domestic security communities. Uh, and that was a, it posits a multi-ton trailer of mixed hazardous waste is intentionally exploded a few miles southwest of Oak Ridge, uh, triggering a major federal response. So, John, I'm going to see if I can advance to the next slide. Um, I seem unable to. Oh, uh, apologies there. I will pass the privileges on to go. you. Perfect. Okay, so we skipped the uh, the abstract slide. Don't worry about not having seen or digested that. Uh, so first, some background. Uh, most of you are familiar with HCIAC and indeed the DoD IAC program uh, as mostly being engaged in the production and dissemination of scientific and technical knowledge. And of course, that's kind of our main charge. Um, as John mentioned, you know, we publish state of the art reports, uh, journal articles, uh, a lot of really good work. It, that notwithstanding, um, as the opening video also alluded to, another key IAC goal is not just to connect relevant information, but relevant people. Um, relevant people and entities in the Homeland Defense space. To paraphrase St. James, great research and development without people is essentially dead information. So, in mid-2022, we began uh, designing a tabletop exercise scenario. Uh, and this posited, uh, it follows on a major, major concern that's growing in the community that the homeland is no longer a sanctuary. Uh, this, of course, you know, accelerated after the 9 11 attacks, uh, but really since 2017 or 2018 um, has been a central concern, uh, especially those of asymmetric attacks, uh, guerrilla warfare. Uh, you know, terrorist activities. So we identified a pretty clear need uh, for really a special in-person training event. And I say special in two, two ways, uh, both that it posited a unique event like the one we, we discussed, but then also that it fell outside of the normal exercise schedule. Uh, you know, all of the major federal agencies from TVA to DHS, uh, to FEMA and on, they are routinely and consistently running exercises to meet you know, specific statutory regulatory requirements, and they are they're fairly well they're fairly well set. Um, the interest here was having one that was not required uh, to meet any uh, any requirements to allow a little bit more free flowing discussion. So how did we develop this concept of the scenario? Uh, thankfully, we didn't start from zero. So HDIAC had completed a free technical inquiry, which is a great plug for another one of our products, uh, in 2016, which it certainly satisfied the customer, uh, but it also kind of stayed stuck in our heads ever since. It's one that we've continually thought about. Uh, the query was from the US Army. Um, they were interested in learning outside of nuclear power plants, what response procedures there were when an outside sensor uh, would be triggered due to the discharge of a radiological dispersion device, an RDD, uh, or some other means of an external radiation release. So what, what they found, what HCI found in short was that uh, while there were protocols, there was really no standard protocol. Uh, and so you can, you already naturally see this uh, as an invitation for a malicious act. Can so we start. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm very sorry, but a number of people are uh, saying that they cannot see the slide. So mm. I, I'm trying to troubleshoot it, and I I can't figure out why it's not um, showing on their end. Yeah. So what I think I want to do is. Um, do a screen share of my screen if you're okay with that and i'll just advance great. the slides uh so everybody can can follow along because it's it's 
it's not just one or two people. It's yeah, many. So if you, if everybody could, if you Joel, if you want to keep going with the briefing, um, while I switch it over, if you're able to, and then I'll try to get it um, uh, switched over. Sure, no problem. Uh, yes. So we um we began from that concept, uh, and and began speaking with with you know major federal officials in the field and. Uh, glad we did that. We we learned pretty quickly um, that that concept, uh, while a great idea, would be exceedingly difficult to to pull off. Um, anytime you get anywhere close to uh, nuclear power and in the territories of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, there's just naturally and understandably and thankfully so, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of oversight and guidance um, and security difficulties. So, in those discussions, um, a new concept or a new solution emerged. We decided to focus on lower tier radiological material, uh, mixed hazardous waste. And this was beneficial for a couple of reasons. One, it's, uh, there's a lot more of it out in the world, which means it is, it is more susceptible uh, you know, to being stolen uh, and used mal maliciously, and it's less secure. So why why did we choose Oak Ridge? Uh, you know, for one, uh, I certainly live here in Oak Ridge, and we have some staff nearby. Uh, but it wasn't just that. Uh, Oak Ridge is a major national security site. Um, if you are not familiar with it, um, founded at the at the start of the Manhattan Project uh, as a secret city for the Manhattan Project. Uh, if you saw the movie Oppenheimer, uh, you would get the impression that. Um, Really, everything of importance in, in creating the bombs occurred in Los Alamos. Uh, but through the end of 1945, 63% uh, of all Manhattan Project funds were spent in Oak Ridge. Um, Oak Ridge was the industrial center uh, for the production of certainly of uranium and the initial pilot site for, for plutonium production. Uh, but since uh, you know, Oak Ridge remains a critical, a critical area of concern. You know, one, we have the Y-12 National Security Site, uh, which is run by the NNSA. Uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory is certainly, a, you know, a valuable place and really only about 50 miles away from us uh, at the TVA Watts Bar Nuclear Power Plant. Uh, that is the only domestic industrial source of tritium which is a key material used in the production of, of nuclear triggers. So, uh, I think back uh, earlier this year, there was a, a high altitude observation balloon that transited the United States. Uh, it certainly hovered over Oak Ridge for a while. And uh, on the west end of town, there are multiple uh, next generation nuclear research programs and companies uh, that are building future facilities. So, a revised scenario, uh, although it was maybe less specifically technically targeted uh, than the original idea with the nuclear power plant, it, we found that it actually brought more community interest. Um, and I think it more deftly touched upon growing national security concerns of, of an asymmetric attack. Okay, next slide, please. So, before you is a, a map and kind of a conceptual overview of the beginning or hour zero of our event. Um, down in the left hand corner, you can see where hostile actors, you know, have intentionally exploded mixed hazardous waste uh, along with other materials that are likely to burn for a long time. Uh, and they do so near uh, an electrical grid substation. So, this is designed uh, with the way the prevailing winds are almost always blowing here. Uh, to flow north northeast towards the federal Oak Ridge Reservation, and you see those two sites that I just mentioned to you, uh, ORNL and Y12, and then right above it, the city of Oak Ridge. So, plus one other benefit of the scenario is that, despite the lack of overall standardization of response uh, to a radiological sensor trigger at nationwide nuclear power plants, there's even less standardization. Uh, or rehearsals and responses in place for this sort of event. Um, it, so this helps us to identi identify response leads. Uh, you know, there's there's 
less legal and other known barriers and restrictions, uh, which is a complicating factor here. So in all, we heard, yes, this is a, a really valuable, really valuable exercise. Uh, next slide, please. So to recap, uh, this was our aim. And, you know, the text here in isolation, uh, you know, these are pretty generic words. Uh, I'll give you that. Strength and capabilities, uh, measure subject matter knowledge, and so on. Uh, but I think the down at the bottom, the procedural and technological pinch points uh, is pretty key. Uh, if you will indulge the historian in me, uh, Melvin Kranzberg, who, who John mentioned, uh, who, who founded kind of the leading group of uh, technological historians, he wrote uh, in the 50s, six laws of technology. One of which is a bit of reversal on an, on an old phrase. He wrote that invention is the mother of necessity, um, not the other way around. And I think, I think this will make intuitive sense when, uh, when you all think, you know, I did not know that my, my kitchen floors were as dirty as they were until the Swiffer was invented and it was a lot easier to clean them continually, it kind of created a higher required level of, of cleanliness. All of which is to say, there's a lot of technology, um, both electronic, gear-based, and other, otherwise, including organizational innovations uh, in the emergency response community. And some of those, at least, are there because they've been created. Uh, and it doesn't mean that they're that they're bad, but there's a, at times an overwhelming amount of potential equipment or response gear that may drive um, actions. Uh, next slide, please. So, putting the event together, uh, our 1st step, we kind of mentioned you know, we began reaching out to to major federal uh, agencies and entities, both in the area and nationally as well. Formed sort of an informal advisory group, uh, you know, spoke with them routinely, uh, briefed them on ideas of the scenario. Uh, and, you know, they gave us good feedback. Uh, we can continue to revise the scenario and, and vetted it with some you know, very knowledgeable folks uh, to get kind of a ground truth that um, that this was feasible and, and you know a reasonable threat. Uh, you know, one of those groups was the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the Readiness Support Center, the RSC. They one of the major programs they do is routinely um, and re pretty comprehensively run tabletop. Uh, and you know, live action exercises uh, across the nation. So that when they gave us kind of a thumbs up on this being a good, good scenario design, uh, we were pleased and went forward. But after that, uh, really just a lot of general publicity and the image here on the right is a, a really nicely appointed promotional flyer that we put together, which uh, you know, we put into the inboxes of, of many, many folks um, and then hard copies. You know, we, we put shoe leather to pavement and you know, went to events uh, here around Oak Ridge and in Knoxville and conferences and and physically put these in the hands of, of some interested parties. After that, you know, we prepared, it was essentially a, a participant packet uh, to send to anyone interested and anyone who would register and, and who would attend uh, in advance so that they would have a better sense of what would occur and then they could prepare Essentially, you know, do some thinking through of their organizations and policies and procedures in advance. So here on the left this is an example of when sent out um, was also a blank template for the you know notional hour by hour uh, exercise. Uh, here, this one was filled out uh, by the Chemical Response Enterprise uh, of the U.S. Army. Um, out of Denver, Colorado, uh, this is Northern Command. So that came as an aid, uh, an example really for other, other entities to see how other groups may respond. Uh, after that, we really was just kind of general event planning, uh, you know, down to a facility and making sure there's, there's good snacks and drinks uh, and arranged a lot of external speakers. Uh, the, the most critical part of all this was gaining local participation. Uh, because, you know, when, if an event like this did occur, 
a lot of the response does come down naturally to local officials. And that was one, really one of our key, our key targets. As a DOD entity, you know, HDI Act has wonderful connections, of course, within the military, but also the federal government. Those are fairly easy to, to maintain and develop. Uh, it was the local folks that, that we did a lot of outreach towards. Next slide, please. So we have a few event photos. Uh, our event went over three days, uh, one full day in the middle and a, and a half day on each side. So the first day started at noon. We had a handful of you know opening speakers, kind of an int introduction to the event, uh, and some external SMEs. So here we've got Dr. Ashley Stowe uh, from the Oak Ridge Enhanced Technology and Training Center, or ORTEC. Uh, and let me just let me heap some praise on him. Uh, a really wonderful presentation. Um, great engagement, and he had, uh, I think he had just a few weeks before, had given uh, an HDI webinar uh, on, on similar topics in early June. So, if you haven't, get to the HDI website to, to watch his presentation. So, we aligned a, a really impressive group of folks to speak um, and to give us kind of a, a contextual background to the scenario. Uh, that was a little more general. They were not focused directly on on the scenario, but it gave us a better sense of you know, what capabilities and, uh, and entities are out there. So we had briefings from uh, National Guard Bureau, J39, Weapons of Mass Destruction Civil Support Team, or CST. Uh, we had someone in the Atmospheric Modeling Group uh, from the Y-12 National Security Center uh, speak to us and show how they they would model atmospheric changes if there were such a release. Uh, we had a senior member from uh, EPA's Region 4, their emergency response team, uh, a very impressive assistant U.S. attorney from the Department of Justice, uh, AUSA for East Tennessee, and Bob Wagner, who is uh, a senior SME for Octant Associates and a former, former DITRA member. And then finally, someone from Department of Homeland Security, the National Urban Security Technology Laboratory. So, a lengthy list of acronyms, which I think gives a good sense uh, that we had some really, really well qualified and knowledgeable people. Next slide, please. So, here's our, our game master, uh, retired Colonel Brad Ward has a lot and long experience in this space. Um, former Army SOF, National Security Council staff member, uh, Army War College. Uh, I won't go too into detail about that, but he also has um, some good hazmat response uh, experience. He is retired, uh, but he's a, a volunteer firefighter here in East Tennessee, so he's not very good at being that retired. Uh, he's, he's extremely active. Next slide, please. So here's another view uh, of our or of our event at the facility at the Pollard Technology Conference Center in Oak Ridge. Now, we did have good attendance, uh, 60 plus, you know, depending on on the time and when people were were checking in and out to make some phone calls, potentially up to 70 beyond. Registrants, um, you know, peak around 100. And that's one lesson learned, um, you know, midsummer, middle of June, uh, always an interesting time. Everyone's always busy, uh, but certainly there were some competing events there. So, let me share a little bit of feedback uh, before we get to some of the, the tabletop findings. Uh, you know, we submitted surveys um, both during and after the event uh, and got really good feedback. So, to the survey question, did the event give you uh, a better understanding or knowledge. Uh, we had 82% either agree or strongly agree, uh, which is really, really quite a good figure. A, a lot of feedback, very positive feedback with the, the SME presentations that I just mentioned. Really people saying, yes, this, this really laid the groundwork um, and made the exercise all the more beneficial. Uh, also, just the sheer fact of getting this array of folks in the room together and getting them to meet 
um, and speak informally during during coffee breaks and lunch. That in itself is is it's hard to put a metric to it, but it's extremely valuable. Uh, we had one major federal officer say, you know, the material was very well researched and presented in a great format for promoting discussions. Uh, we had another federal officer say, this was great. It raised so many what ifs, um, and that was pretty much exactly what we were we were hoping to do. Uh, next slide, please. So now to the to the meat. Um, what did our participants gain from the tabletop exercise? Um, and what did we as hosts learn? Uh, there's a lot of text here. Uh, and again, we'll, we'll be sharing these slides and I'm certainly not going to read these out. I just want to highlight, highlight a few, few bullets from each slide. Uh, so up at the top, the consequence management community would benefit from more exercises focused on asymmetric events. Uh, we found this to be extremely true. Um, and especially to have an asymmetric event exercise occur outside of the normal calendar schedule of, of required exercises. Um, this really helped the free flow of information. Um, you know, people were able to freely discuss things because not necessarily that, that what they were saying needed to be off the record, uh, but it was just a little bit more informal. We had heard that um, before the event and certainly hoped that it would be true. Uh, and then it was reiterated uh, and confirmed in the feedback that we got later. Uh, so second, uh, the third third bullet down, you know, emergency action plans and incident plans rarely address asymmetric threats like this. And when they do, their treatment is limited in scope. You know, we had one, one comment um, on wanting to know the ideal stream of information were such an event to occur. Information in, in terms of coordination amongst response groups. And it's very clear uh, an ideal stream, one, does not exist, certainly on paper, um, and really cannot exist. This is an extremely difficult planning task um, and really just bringing up the fact that it's very difficult to plan for these is itself very valuable. Uh, fourth, fourth bullet down, uh, while sufficient type PPE appears to exist for most first responders, um, there are major questions regarding where and when um, and which suitable PPE to use. Uh, this is a huge question. Um, you know, how do you decide which level um, and type of, of PPE to don? Is it normal hazardous materials protective equipment? Is it CBRN focused? Um, who has it? Um, and when will they arrive? Uh, and will it be shared across agencies if needed? And, and there's a question here too that uh, some responders are especially likely to basically heroically rush in to an event like this, um, you know, potentially without the Quote, correct PPE, um, you know, to start saving lives and, and addressing the threat. And you know, John, I think you had um, you had another comment on this item. Is that right? Yeah, Joel. Thank you uh, again, John Clements here, and uh, I was I was present at the event as you know, being the HDI technical lead, kind of had some oversight of, of things. And this is that is what really stuck out to me is the lesson learned from this event is when you combine these multiple hazards. Uh, especially if you combine a chemical threat or a radiological threat with fire, there really isn't a, an appropriate level of PPE that that exists. And um, I just what sticks in my mind is one of the uh, I believe it was the chief of a fire department said it hey, will turn will turn into shrink wrap, meaning if they wear you know a Tyvek suit outside of their fire protective suit, it's just going to melt. And uh, so there, there is no good way right now. Um, and as you said, Joel, some of these, they may have to, depending on the danger and the threat to the public, they may have to go into this area regardless of that. And um, it, it, there's nothing out there that I know of right now that protects from all those hazards at the same time. I think you're right. Um, next slide, please. 
Uh, so up at the top, uh, participants expressed limited familiarity with NORTHCOM um, and other Department of Defense domestic response uh, capabilities. Uh, the Defense Board of Civil Authorities, DISCA, especially as well, um, is always a thorny issue. And uh, certainly these groups are, are are very active in trying to get the word out. It's just, it's a, it's a very difficult task. Uh, we had had a, uh, an in-person briefer aligned from NORTHCOM's Chemical Response Enterprise, who um, very near the end had to cancel uh, for an emergency. It certainly makes sense that happens. Uh, the briefers from the WMD civil support team, they did speak uh, to DISCA and to the NORTHCOM capability some, uh, and they work extremely hard uh, on engagement and communication. But, you know, I think this, this bullet, this is a compelling lesson for DOD domestic assets at large, and it's one that they know about. We assume that, you know, disaster, major disaster response will be like it is in the movies. Um, the army shows up pretty soon. Uh, there's a discussion where someone in a suit and tie, uh, some bureaucrat cites the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878, but before too long, it all gets worked out uh, and, and the day is saved. It's just much, much more complicated than that. And then finally, this bullet down at the bottom, uh, while sophisticated response and monitoring equipment are present across Oak Ridge Reservation or ORR, uh, you know, it was only fairly recently that some of these mutual aid agreements with the city itself, uh, which hosts, you know, all of these major national security sites um, signed. The, the, the Oak Ridge Reservation, the ORR, sounds a lot more formal than it really is. Uh, there's really a spaghetti bowl here of jurisdictional, organizational, uh, et cetera, kind of overlap. You know, and then you throw in the, the 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 role of contractors and how that how that kind of governs, and there's an opportunity there I think potentially for greater homeland defense coordination um, potentially in the future, especially given the um, I'd say national level interest in boosting uh, homeland defense capabilities. Uh, next slide. Uh, so our second bullet here, consequence management entities would benefit from additional resourcing and rehearsal around interagency transition points, um, especially among federal, state, local entities. We discussed this a little bit, but you know, one thing one thing that was mentioned that we get we need to be practicing kind of off the wall incidents like this more, um, and I think maybe perhaps in smaller bites. It seems that a lot of the the work here is done either in in maybe larger, more formal tabletop exercise exercises, or it's done in a out in the field live action rehearsal exercise that is often very focused on uh, you know logistics and deploying equipment, you know the kind where you have you know paid actors who are you know pretending to have been affected by you know, some chemical agent and you know, responders respond to them and, and really then do test if they have the, the proper equipment. I, I think there's a space here for more live action exercises that are focused on the, you know, we'll call it boring stuff. Uh, the administrative issues, the jurisdictional steps, uh, who calls who to say, hey, I, I'm going to cross this this boundary here into your space and but unfortunately, you know, we're unable to be in communication with so on. Uh, you know, what do we do? Is this is this okay? Is this allowed? How do we how do we better coordinate? Uh, and then let's see the the fourth bullet down. Uh, large scale civilian population decontamination and evacuation procedures must be refined. You know, this is this is not something that we we focus on a lot in the tabletop, but I know that especially for uh, the groups that do CBRN, uh, you know, live action exercises, decontamination will will be the weak the weak link, uh, or not weak, but most one of the most difficult challenges. 
There are limited resources. It is a time and labor intensive activity. And, and there was some discussion of this. It, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, if you announce that there is a need uh, for the population to be contaminated, well, then they will request to be decontaminated whether or not they really need to be. Uh, you know, and one small thing here, which is actually rising concern, especially for, for the chemical response enterprise, uh, pets and especially dogs, uh, it is just an absolute must uh, that they must be decontaminated, decontaminated as part of this process. Uh, that's for two reasons. One, in you know, 2006, the Pets Evacuation and Transportation Standards Act um, was passed and amended the Stafford Act, which is the major disaster uh, statute. And it, this has always been the case, but I think especially in in the wake of the pandemic with the massive jump in pet ownership, if someone cannot take their, their dog with them, they, you know, they will not decontaminate or they will, they will not comply with other, other emergency response orders. Um, I certainly know that's, that's the case for me. If I couldn't take, take my dog Rose with me. Uh, next slide, please. So areas for improvement. Um, I think you know this is one of our most important slides here. No event worth its salt goes off without a hitch. Uh, you know we seriously and genuinely solicited all feedback uh, from participants, and we're really grateful to those you know who gave us you know critical critical feedback where where it was. So you know I don't think I need to really read. Through all of these, I think these are straightforward, but there were some other areas, or I'll call them hindrances uh, to putting on an event of this nature. And, and we don't mention these to excuse the areas for improvement, but to you know, just note kind of the realm of how can you best put on an asymmetric event tabletop exercise that does fall out of you know, the normal required exercise schedule. Uh, you know, one that we found is that you know most exercises, even tabletops, are planned at minimum a year and a half in advance, um, if not much more. The exercise schedule for a given area is usually pretty packed. Um, I believe there was a Department of Energy exercise in Oak Ridge the the week before uh, our event, and and one about a week after. Uh, that HDIAC is a, a DOD entity, uh, you know, led some, some local state folks to believe that it was, you know, quote, some super secret squirrel stuff. And, uh, and understandably so, uh, you know, Oak Ridge is mostly a Department of Energy town. Uh, you see the, the seal of, of the Department of Defense. And for people who may not you know, be familiar with the department or really have much interaction with with military folks whether uniformed or civilian you know if there's a if there's a barrier there familiarity you know they may be less less inclined to get involved i think the core value of our exercise was the scenarios complexity uh, the technical complex complexity and the the asymmetric, asymmetric nature of it but then again the lack of a, a government owner that's a big benefit. It also made it um, less persuasive for some groups to very understandably uh, commit valuable and rare time and resources to uh, to send people to attend. Um, you know, I think eight to sixteen you know working hours for for one individual. When you add in travel time, potentially you know uh, airfare and and hotels and that's a significant, that's a significant commitment of resources. And, you know, 1 of the bullets discussed earlier in. In the findings is that many, if not all of these groups are, and will always be. Um, you know, underfunded, um, understaffed the, the threats are rising. Um, faster than the, the commitment to funding um, or resourcing them is uh, it's just kind of the nature of the business. Uh, next slide, please. 
it so as the saying goes uh it takes a village to put on an exercise uh that is certainly true i uh, really want to thank brad ward our our game master uh, and all of our speakers there and then uh two outside advisors in particular uh lieutenant colonel Wes sumner of the cbrn program management office in northcom and bob wagner again from Octon associates they really uh were just very, very welcoming um, and very, very free with their time to to advise us and help us out and really open a lot of doors to making connections with, uh, with other folks. Um, and then finally, uh, highest thanks to John Clements here on this call uh, and Joe Cole of Key Logic, who um, you know, really, really, really drove and made this this entire event possible. So with that, Thank you to all of them and thank you to all of you for being on here and we will we'll take some questions. Rachel, thank you so much. Um, there is one question in the Q&A that came up, a very good question from Kevin Dennison. Um, the question is, was there any consideration of agricultural impacts such as identifying an agricultural product area of concern and instituting procedures to keep agricultural animals and products from exiting that area until more testify, sorry, until more testing clarifies the risks. That is a wonderful question. Um, I know that that is an issue that we have we raised and put into kind of the exercise framework. Uh, we we ended up restricting the notional time uh, of the event to be almost real time. So you know, I think we we went an hour. Gameplay was about an hour in real life, so we got maybe six hours into the event. Um, perhaps for that reason, um, that did not come up, uh, but also raised another another good point, which is the the array of interested or involved uh, government entities is exceptionally broad. Um, I don't think that we had anyone from you know an agricultural or um, you know commerce based. Uh, you know, government agency, you know, if we had, you know, that very well may have come up earlier on. Yeah, uh, yeah very good question. And uh, yeah, I think the short answer is kind of no, it didn't come up during this play, but because of what you said, Joel, it, we focused on the first few hours. And I think before any responders would have been able to even get to that point. Um, but it leads me to two things. First, I will plug that. By tomorrow, it should be, um, HCI actually just is, is about to release the uh, uh, state-of-the-art report on agriculture security in the United States. Now, it's not directly related to this in the sense of um, related to a hazmat or mixed hazardous waste um, event, but you know the, the term agriculture came up and the, the report's about to come, up, come out, so I thought I'd, I'd plug that a little bit. But I... I also want to point out related to this uh, in the chat, uh, I am, there's a Mr. Craig Dowdle, uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing that a little bit wrong, but uh, is discussing an event that they, had, uh, he's aware of um, from the Atlanta Fulton County Emergency Management Agency and a few others, uh, including the National Guard and uh, teams of veterinarians and fire departments. Um, and they, he, he actually posted this, I believe, before the question came in or right as the question came in. Uh, and, and they ran an exercise, uh, which included decontaminating um, large, large farm animals to include equine, the horses mm. and, and that. And, um, you know, they, they had a positive experience. But uh, one of the things he points out is that local fire departments that had experience with large animals and animal rescue took the lead on that event. So. It's kind of an uh, interesting how that ties in with uh, Kevin's question there. Uh, so appreciate the input from the community. On, on, on. That really is, and, and that does remind me, I, I just pulled up a, a file to see. Um, one of our initial kind of planning and outreach calls uh, at the very start of, of this, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Department of Interior was involved. And, and again, um, you know, whether probably resourcing that um, you know, they were unable to to send someone someone on or again uh, you know planning planning an exercise you know, right under 12 months ahead always difficult to you know get all the proper slots and 
and folks lined up for their involvement. Yeah, absolutely. This was an event that um, uh, the folks that attended weren't beholden to us uh, to, to attend. So it was <laughs> strictly voluntary, um, which was a bit of a limitation, but also uh, facilitated a lot of, um, uh, uh, of information sharing because people came there because they wanted to. So uh, with that, I uh, there's no other questions in there. There's a couple comments still coming in through through the chat. Uh, I will pause to let folks know there was an after action review written for this event. Uh, we were intending to have it ready and available prior to this webinar, but it will be up on our website um, by early next week. Um, so if if you're interested, uh, it's not a very long read, but you will also get the the appendices, which goes through the entire exercise gameplay, uh, as well as um, uh, some pre-read packets, how we set up the scenario. So if you're interested in this kind of event, that might give you a good jumping off point written by uh, Mr. M written by a number of people, but really championed by Mr. Brad Ward, who is truly an expert in this area. Uh, so um, I am um, just looking to see if any of these comments coming in are, are last minute questions. It doesn't look like any specific questions, so, um, but good comments nonetheless. But Joel, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, and again, to the community, please be on the lookout as we release our next state of the art report, probably tomorrow, and then the AAR for this event early next week. If you have questions about the event or questions in general, technical questions that HDI can help answer, uh, please reach out to us. You can go to hdiac.org. Uh, and submit a technical inquiry or email us at contact at hdiac.org and we'd be happy to field your question. But again, thank you very much, Joel. Thank you, John. Thank you everyone for being with us today.